Today's sales leaders face a difficult task, selling the right products at the right time through the right channels. A new three-day program from Harvard Business School Executive Education addresses this problem directly. Join us on the Boston campus in August for Managing Sales Teams and Distribution Channels, where you will discover strategies that can lead to the best sales performance. Learn more by clicking the banner or visiting hbs.me slash sales. That's hbs.me slash sales. Blog Talk Radio. Coward. Welcome to the war room. We got Dez, Kim, Jimmy, PJ, B. Austin, the hot block commander. How you want to end up one or two hour show and keep the brain running with the premise of talk sports on a national level. Roll with yep. the topics, sort of like the yeah. rubber when it's game time, they like the bad five door and prime time. Sports conglomerates, speak their minds a little bit. For sports medicine and sports veterans and great. The 4 for 26, so the war ain't can wait. It's the war room with five nights at the round table. Five silly guys diversified and educated. What up, War Room family? You are once again live in the War Room, brought to you by War Room Sports on the War Room Sports Podcast Network. I'm one of your hosts. I'm Devin McMillan. I'm in the building with my brothers. We got B. Austin. What up, B? And the homie Jimmy the Blueprint. The NBA Conference Finals are set. Uh, we're a little sad here that our uh, Philadelphia 76ers are not a part of that action, but it's all good. But, look, it's going to be a basketball-heavy episode. Settle in. Keep it locked right here. And if you want to get in on the conversations, make sure you join us right now in the JW Philly Realty chat room at blogtalkradio.com slash the war room. Or join us on Facebook or Twitter at War Room Sports. You can also call us directly in about five minutes when we open up the Digital Extreme Tech Hotline. That number is 323-410-0012. And last thing before we get the conversation started, make sure like every week we tell you, this, make sure that during the week when we're not live on the air, you check out archive episodes of our show so you can catch up on everything we've talked about in the week prior. You can get there at warroomsports.com or the War Room Sports mobile app, which is free on Android and iOS, iTunes, TuneIn, Stitcher, and any other place that you do your podcast listening. What up? What up, homies? This is America. Did you guys check that? Your homie Childish Gambino, a.k.a. Donald Glover. Well, uh, part of my, go ahead, Austin. No, no, no. Go ahead, go ahead. Because I don't say nice no, things about was, Childish Gambino. No, all I was going to say is, uh, pardon, pardon to listen. If, uh, my voice goes in and out or whatever. Pause, because uh, you know I'm, I'm in my flu game, John. But uh, to answer Jeff's questions about Childish, um, I think it was a, a great piece of art. Not that I necessarily agree with anything that was in there, but not that I disagree. But I saw a lot of conversation in the, um, about his art, and he's an artist, and I think it's dope. He just dropped it, didn't say anything about it. He didn't have to, like, you know, tell you how to feel about it. He didn't tell you what he was trying to express. He just let the piece speak for itself. Um, and that's what all great art should be. Uh, like I said, great art is going to spark conversation. You don't necessarily have to agree with um, what's being said. Or disagree, but you you know it, it just sparked conversation. So to that end, it was yeah, it was it was a, a a pretty dope piece, and the fact that you know he it, there was a lot going on. It's one of those things like the conversations were telling you you had to watch it several times and try not to be distracted by him and the dancing and the stuff that he was doing. So you can peep everything that's going on yeah. in the background. It was kind of like a microcosm of how society is today, whereas there's so much going on in the background. But, you know, a lot of people, or, you know, so we think, a lot of people let the, the, the thing that's right in your face distract you from what's going on back there. But, you know, I heard a lot of he's a genius and that kind of stuff. I mean, I've heard that also about his writing on Atlanta this season. Um, people just throw that G word around like nothing these days. That's probably why you got Kanye saying everybody's the kind of stuff a genius. That you're saying now, you know, what I'm saying once you tell somebody they're a genius, then they have to start acting like a genius. And most geniuses that we've ever seen, you know, weirdos, a little eclectic, a little, 
you know, detached from reality. You know, a couple, a couple, a couple years ago, Kanye West was a genius. Come on, y'all. Yeah, and that's what I'm saying. That's that's why Kanye went where you know where he is now because he like, look, I'm a genius. I got to start acting like a genius. So you start saying crazy yeah. stuff. You start wearing yeah. crazy stuff. You start doing crazy stuff. Genius stuff. <laughs> um. The one thing that I picked out, and, I, and I've only seen it once, I, I got to go back and watch it another three to four times. Um, but I love the Behold the Pale Horse reference with uh, yeah, Death riding on the so horse good. and the police car uh, Power rolling Power. behind it. That was that was absolute. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was an absolute. Um, that was an absolute genius <laughs> thing. <laughs> I, I thought for him to do. <laughs> um, but uh, overall, you know, I, listen. He's a genius, I think that man. His, I think that his, um, I think that his move in making this is just indicative of some of the level of consciousness that parts of this generation that are currently kind of running uh, expressive art and. Uh, popular hip hop culture have some of them. You know, we still got the hibbity, hibbity, hibbity. the Lils and the Youngs are still very prevalent, but there's also a, a kind of a sub genre or a niche of guys that are speaking with their hearts and minds, and it has substance. So, you know, salute to him. You know, I've heard him. I think he's a little confused on some of the things or positions that he takes. Uh, he's definitely a proponent of uh, and perpetuator of colorism, um, but that's a whole nother conversation. Salute to him for the for the piece of art. It was a, it was a good look. Right. No doubt, gonna be awesome trying to um, hint to y'all that his 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 lady is white, but <laughs> it's all good. Shout out to to, to him in the, in the video. In Atlanta, <laughs> Atlanta is definitely one of my favorite shows. Uh, right now, um, shout, out to, um, shout out to Bibby. Right. Shout out to Bibby. Um, shout out to Bibby and Teddy Perkins. <laughs> no doubt. All right, so um, let's jump right in. Everything, man. We got hot topics that we need to talk about. And hot topics are brought to you by my bookie. What up, fam? Let's talk turkey and how much of it you can make investing in in sports contests at my bookie. The NBA and NHL playoffs are chugging along, so if you haven't yet checked them out, this is pretty much one of the better times in the year to do so. Lay down some dough on the biggest games in sports. Join us and thousands of other online players placing bets at mybookie.ag. You tired of getting the runaround when it's time for a payout? That's why we urge you to join my bookie. No ass betting. You win, they pay fast without any hassles. You're wasting your time investing your money anywhere else. They even have in-game live betting so you can place wages after tip-off, kickoff, face-off. Join now, and my bookie will match your first deposit with a 50% bonus. Just use promo code WARROOM, all caps, W-A-R-R-O-O-M, to activate this offer. Visit mybookie.ag today. Play, win, get paid, period. All right, so the NBA playoffs have been, um, like I said, chugging along in full effect. The conference finals are set, and we're definitely going to uh, analyze and, and predict those a little bit later on. But I want to talk about a little something, you know, near and dear to our hearts, since we're all Philly guys. Um, the Philadelphia 76ers just went down to their all-time rival, the Boston Celtics, in a five-game series. Um, as far as how many games it went, you know, it was it was basically a, a slaughterhouse series, but. You know, if you watch all five games, then most of them, I think four out of the five, were right down to the wire, and it was a great series. The Sixers, in their current state, just couldn't pull out many of the games at the end. So they've been the topic of a lot of conversation today, just like they have over the past month with the with the run that they were on going into the playoffs, you know, what they did to Miami in the first round. But I just wanted to get – some opinions from you guys on why the series went the way it went and what's the outlook for this team in the future, because there's a lot of fans saying a lot of stuff. Um, some people are real down on the team, down on the coach. 
Uh, some people are begging for other people's superstars. Some people are begging for the ultimate superstar. But but judging from those games, what did you guys see? And what was you know some of the main reasons that this team got ousted in five um, games to an undermanned Boston Celtics team? It always it always baffles me, man. Um, just how much the culture of immediacy really runs the world today. Like, literally, people make decisions on a player, their ability, and their future from quarter to quarter. Like, you can you can literally have a bad quarter and you're the worst player ever. You can have a good quarter and you're the best player ever. And the problem is we're not talking hyperbole here. Like, these yeah. people really bounce back and forth and flip-flop. It's not like when uh, – What's the uh, – somebody after the other game the other night, B? Somebody said um, Jason Tatum is yeah. the rookie of the year. I'm like, yo, that been over. What? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yo. Any, I, I mean, it's – it's it's I, I, first of all, salute to, salute to our guys. You know, um, I feel like – I feel like we saw the future, and it is very, very bright. I just feel like they had a bad series because they're young. I I do think that Ben Simmons needs to further develop his offensive game because it's like he can get buckets, but he can't consistently get buckets. Like you can't pencil him in for 25 yet. It's not surprising when he gets 25 or 30. But it's not a given that he's going to get. And why is that? Because he cannot shoot a basketball, and he's a professional basketball player. And so at the very minimum, I think that his offensive skill set is probably a little worse than James Harden when James – not James Harden, I'm sorry, uh, LeBron James when LeBron James came into the league. I think even LeBron could shoot a, a little bit, well, a lot better than he can. So we need him to get his shot together. We need him to get, you know, a solid one or two, maybe even three go-to moves. Joel Embiid just needs to – Joel Embiid needs to get his health together and his wind, like his conditioning. Like if – I feel like if his conditioning were better, he would have had a bigger impact on – He needs some hand strengthening. On on, the squeeze on the joints that – People used to have the vice grip looking joint. You know, his yeah, 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 yeah. To hold on to the ball. Yeah, yeah. You got to hold on to the ball. If he was um, an NFL player, think, he'd fumble a lot. If he'd be a fumbler. He'd be a coward. Yeah. Um, I think that the Celtics salute to them. They are. They got tired hearing about Gordon Hayward and Kyrie Irving not being there, and they wanted yeah. to say, "Listen, we're 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 a quality." group of professionals and we got some great rookie talent and we come to the party to, you know, to do our thing. So I'm not mad. I think that the Sixers core, their core guys talent wise are better, but I think Boston overall has a more talented supporting cast that can do a little bit more. So that just beat out the Sixers. man. I mean, because you can say a lot of their games, and how they finished them. This wasn't anything new. We just haven't seen it in a while because of the run they had late in the season when they were playing, you know, the easiest competition they've played all season. We didn't get to see a lot of games. Like, during that run, there were a lot of blowouts, which made a lot of people forget that earlier in the season, all the way up through midway through the season, like, the Sixers could have, like, after seeing how they finished the season, you think to yourself, like, damn, the Sixers could have won 60 games this year because they blew leagues and, you know, and lost and almost, and almost at least every game. eight games. At least. Even the games, so, yeah. even the games yeah. they won, they were blowing, like, 30-point leagues. Um, right. I just want to chime in real quick. They barely sticking the games out. But, Jimmy, you know, we used to watch the games earlier in the season, even the ones that they, you know, the ones that they did blow. You know, the game would get close late in the game, and then they would just forget how to play basketball. They start turning it over a lot. 
And all of those problems resurfaced in this playoff series. You could blame that, you know, on youth. You could blame it on coaching. I mean, Boston doesn't want to hear that because they're a pretty young team as well. But what I told somebody in a conversation um, earlier this week, youth, you can, like, youth can be your excuse. I mean, you can clearly see when youth is plaguing a team, especially late in games, and that's in any sport. However, youth doesn't have to be. Scared. So when, when you say youth and then somebody hits you with the retort, like, well, Boston's young too. Okay. Well, Boston's young, but they're not stupid. <laughs> Boston's young. They, they, they're probably, not even probably, they're better coached. But, but to that point, Boston, they're better coached and they also have that veteran presence. Also um, been there. Um, <laughs> Shout out to the Pistons. Uh, big, Big, oh, excuse me, they have Al Horford, um, Big Al. Who, who was like a calming presence. Because you've seen a couple of times where they were going to let things slide, and he made a play. Um, he, played, he played brilliant in the series. you got to give him his credit. He right. played like timely plays where they were getting ready to blow a game, and he stepped in. The Sixers don't have that. They don't have their right. version of Al Horford. <laughs> yeah, because the Sixers, quote-unquote, veteran leader, he turned the ball just as, over just as much in crucial situations as the young dudes. And I'm speaking of J.J. Redick. Like, he can't dribble. Yeah. So, yeah, no matter what, his at, he's, he's a higher, he's a higher gun. At thing. all. He's a higher gun. But to, but to get back to your original question, I think a lot of it was um, they were outcoached. I mean, they were clearly outcoached. Um, were outcoached, but also they didn't have that veteran leadership in um well, in the whiskey, he has to, like, get his ass on the block. And, like, it's very frustrating at times watching him, you know, do what a lot of these big guys do because anytime he gets on the block, on the block, he's causing issues. He's getting open shots for other people, and he's getting, you know, points or fouls for himself. One of the things he did that was brilliant in the Miami series is he got to the line so much and got the other team in foul trouble. He got, uh, you know, a team a lot of foul shots, got in a penalty early. He wasn't doing that this series. This series, he, you know, he was – he was floating out there like he was Dirk. Um, and it hmm. got frustrating at times watching that. You know what I mean? So, uh, you know. And you know that, what the most frustrating too. part is, though, Jim? The most frustrating part is, a sh- you know, the stretch right before those times, you get the ball in the post five or six times straight. And like you just said, you make something happen five or six times. You're either going to score, you're going to go to the foul line, you're going to get an open shot for somebody else. And it's like you or the coach – doesn't you know the like neither one of these entities realized like okay for six plays in a row he just went down there and punished this other team so why for the next five or six plays he's going to float around the three-point line well that comes back to in my opinion with brad just with b austin just said a couple minutes ago talking about him being in shape him having wind i think that's his way of resting I think yeah. he like all right, I'm thing. He can stay out while. there. I'm gonna hover around here and not do anything. But if they throw it to me, I'm gonna shoot three. You know what I'm saying? And yeah. I think it has. There you go. <clears throat> but so that coaching that, wise, that, that's like, kind of frustrating. If you're gonna be in the game because a lot of times I saw him try to take Embiid out and Embiid complain. You're gonna be in the game. Get your big ass down on the block and punish these people. Yeah. Punish. Yeah. So, uh, but also to your point, Dev, uh, it's also growing pains because this team is ahead of the, ahead of the, where the process was to be. Um, going right. into the season, a lot of people just wanted to see if they can make the playoffs, and that would be a win. That's one, and also, um, I think Markel Fultz. And a lot of experts didn't right believe now, they could problem. either, Jim. He, he's a yeah. problem that can be a solution, like because I, I'm ready to make a judgment on Markel Fultz. I see people calling him a bust already. Um, I see people saying they should have got Tatum. I mean, Tom will tell all that. Yo, the, the little, yo, the little bit Jimmy, that see, the little bit. The, we... the, the pom poms have made me a Markel Fultz fan because I get so irate at people calling him a bust. I haven't seen him play. Well, that's I the thing. Like, for really me, play to call him a bust. He might be. Yeah, he might be. I don't know. Like, I, I'm just not ready to make that assertion yet. That's one. Um, Two. It, it, it is kind of it is it is difficult to watch when you see Tate doing what he does and his skill set because he probably would fit right in with what that. But at the same time, um, if they had got Tatum, they probably wouldn't have been able to move get the Euro shooters they got because they would have been in a different position. So you don't know how things play out. One, it's like the butterfly effect. You get Tatum and you don't know how the whole team ends up. 
But at the same time, you have to give Foles a chance to play because he was number one overall. It wasn't just a six that him ranked high. Um, Yo, so give the kid a I chance hope, to play. I hope Foles turns play. into 20, 20 and 8. I hope he turns so into what I'm 20 and 8. The skills, the skills that he showed in the limited time that he played up in the series because he was able to create his own shot, and he was very athletic, and that's one thing they were missing. A lot of those guys are one-dimensional. They have a lot of guys, guys are shooters. They don't have anyone that can create their own shot and get to the hole. Um, right. And the thing about Ben with his jump shot, like, you know, I mean, that's where the coaching comes into play. You have to figure out a way to put him in a position to uh, make better plays. The same way the coaches figured out a way, okay, this is what we're going to do to focus on Ben. So um, there's a lot of nuance to basketball. And when you watch it, you're like, that, and that's why, like, Brad Stevens is giving his just due because he put together a game plan and he came out and executed yeah, for me, it, it, with Ben in this series, it wasn't even just his jump shot. I don't know if you guys noticed, but he picks up his dribble a lot. And I guess when you're 6'10", you can do that because if you do it and then somebody gets up on you, you can just hold the ball up and throw it over their head. So I guess that could be, you know, a situation for a point guard that's not as serious as it's traditionally been because of the size of this point guard. But I, I, I keep wondering, like, why does he always pick up his dribble? For him, it's not all about the shooting for me. It was it was a confidence thing, I think. I mean, and I think that stems from the lack of shooting. Like, a, a lot of situations, he just didn't feel confident because even though they were backing off of him and daring him to do that, they were sticking like glue to the shooter. So it's like, at this point, dude, you got to do something. They're not letting you get that pass to J.J. And if he does, he's going to be in his jersey the same time the ball gets there. So it's like we, we got to figure out something else. Um, as far as Brett Brown is concerned, uh, a lot of fans are on him. I, I've, I've had some people that I know that's been nagging about Brett Brown all season, even before this season. But I'm willing to give him the benefit of the doubt because, you know, as a head coach, just like the core of his team, he was pretty much a playoff rookie as well. Like, these are learning experiences for the coach, for the team. I mean, his team, this is his first year of actually having a team that was even worthy of winning, you know, a decent amount of games, even challenging for the playoffs. So I pretty much think he's learning the team just as the team is learning him. And another another thing, you know, with his substitution patterns and stuff like that, the Sixers – rely heavily on analytics. As a matter of fact, they have the biggest analytics department in the entire league. So, you know, when you read up on stuff like that, you kind of get an idea of why his substitution patterns are always the same, why he's trying to get certain lineups in the game. But something that he needed to learn, and I think he learned late in the series, probably too late, that you can't always rely on that. You have to switch some things up. And I know you guys saw the last two games, you know, you saw some different lineups in there. Um, Not even just him starting TJ in the last two games, but you saw just different combinations in there and they actually were working because if the Boston Celtics decided, look, we are going to take the three point line away. This team is still big enough and talented enough to win games in the paint. And they did that for, you know, game four Almost did it for game five, but it's mm-hmm. something that they can, you know, rust their, their, their hats on in the future um, when the analytics stuff isn't working. So he has to learn how to adjust through that kind of stuff. And I think that's something that Brad Stevens and his money, money, limited, ball. money, ball. And his limited <laughs> experience as well, but more than Brett Brown, I think Brad Stevens has learned that pretty quickly in this league. Cause you, you saw him make a lot also, of changes. Um, Salute to Pete because he got his he got he got his mom's spaghetti moment and clearly took advantage of it. Uh, E.J. McConnell that is so salute to him for that. No doubt, yo. T.J. <clears throat> T.J. McConnell might be the most overachieving human being in the history of humanity because I just don't <laughs> even see him as a basketball player, let alone in the NBA. But he finds a way to get it done. Like he's not a bum. At all. No. No. I mean, when he first came to the team undrafted during the middle of the process, when you thought he was just going to be 
you know, one of those guys being used. And I think that was always the, the, you know, what they were trying to do. But he actually <laughs> got better. That said, when they went to the – when they went to the YMCA and they found him, and they said, oh, yeah, they we found put him, him on the Sixers for a little while. <laughs> I, I really think he was he was meant to be one of those guys, and he and Covington stuck around. Covington, uh, he got them for that contract this season because he ain't showed up since. Um, but back to the, the false thing real quick. No, he's a piece of shit. <laughs> yeah. <Yo. laughs> Back to the Fultz thing. That's Covington he's talking about, not Fultz. I I fully understand. Yeah, Covington. Now a lot of fans really dig the fact that Markel couldn't get any minutes. I, I'm, I'm at some point in the series, I'm like, yeah, he could get some minutes. We're kind of desperate, back against the wall. So at that point, I understood. But earlier, you know, throughout the the, the early part of the series and last series, I fully understood why. Markel Fultz wasn't getting the minutes, and he went with TJ instead. The Sixers, for all the talent that they do have, lack ball handling. And a lot of people get ball handling and moves mixed up. At this point in his career, Markel Fultz, in his best, at his best, is not a reliable ball handler. Only ones they have is Ben Simmons and TJ McConnell. And you saw that when when the basketball play switched up on them in the Miami series and Brett Brown and the rest of the team realized how physical NBA defenses get once it um, becomes playoff yeah. time. Playoff. And playoff how much time. harder it yeah, is like- to just bring the ball up the court and set up the offense. So for the little bit of minutes that he did get in in that Miami series, he looked overwhelmed by the pressure. And it looked like it scared – Brett Brown to death, his experiment was over, and, and Markel was down for the rest of the playoffs. And I, I understand it fully. He has a lot to work on. He's only played in 14 um, NBA games, yeah. most of them meaningless, yeah. because the first stint earlier in the season, he was laboring. You could tell he was hurt, so they sat him down for most of the season. Then he comes back when the team has already gelled perfectly, they're in the midst of, the, of this, you know, amazing 17-game winning streak. You put him in there, and he shines and shows you some of the things that he can do, but it's not really, you know, the, the chemistry aspect of it is not really enough to throw him in on what has now turned into a serious playoff run. So I fully understood it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, we, we pretty we pretty yeah. much hit everything with the head. I mean – there's a number of reasons. There's not one specific reason, but also you have to give Boston credit because yeah. there were times where the sisters like would, would would do something or make and they just they always had an answer. Always. Always. Remember, we were watching. Yeah, I kept so, complaining to you like, "Yo, these dudes answer everything. Everything." Yeah. Sixers get a little lead. Yeah, so you got smack a three, and Boston smack a three, get a stop, come smack another three, and they right back. Tied up or right back in, and the that's the sign. That's like the that. sign of a. That's the sign of a well coached team. He made a lot of adjustments. He made. To, he called timeouts at the right time. Um, he knew when his team needed a bucket. His um, you know um, the, his ATOs, which I've never heard until this year. And now I'm tired of hearing that phrase ATO. He has the greatest <laughs> ATO game ever. You know um, for those who don't know what that is, it's like after timeout plays. Um, <laughs> I swear I never heard that, yo. The funny thing is, Yo, I, actually I, refuse, think, I, refuse I think to that's use a it. strength of Brett Brown, um, except when it's after a timeout with a few seconds left in the game. <laughs> but all throughout the game, when and, and that has to go a lot to the players as well. In these different situations, they're a little bit more on edge, So and you can tell. Late in the game, like, like the Sixers and their ATOs <laughs> are successful all throughout the game. But then late in the game, Yo, am I the only? Am I the only? Am I the only one who just got put down with that um, that acronym? Like I heard that before this year. No, I've never heard it before either until this this series. Okay. You're talking about this year, I haven't heard it. Before no. This series. And, and, but no, and, 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 and I'm that, still going to call it an after timeout play. But the thing about Brad Stevens, not only does it work throughout the game, it works at the end of the game, 
and 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 you know that goes to the players as well though you know the players aren't out there super nervous in these periods and they run what they run all game without the nerves and it and it works late whereas the Sixers hasn't hit that point yet where you know they still have they they still have two modes you know what I'm saying you have the all throughout the game mode and then you have the the late game mode and they still have hasn't they haven't mastered late game mode yet. Um, so so it's interesting. I think it's a very bright future for the team, like you guys mentioned earlier. I think a lot of Philly fans, as usual, you know, are jumping off bridges and making too much of things. Um, when Jimmy mentioned earlier, like this whole thing is ahead of schedule anyway, because even though it was a goal of the organization to finally try to win games and get into the playoffs this season, there were a lot of people out there, quote unquote experts who didn't believe that it was going to happen. So to, to not only win 52 games, let alone the fact that we told you guys without their late game breakdowns, they could have won so many more. Like this is a team that could get a 20 point lead on any team in the league, warriors included because they've done it. Lost a 24-point lead to the Warriors. Lost a 23, 22-point lead to the Celtics in London. Lost a 22-point lead to the Celtics in the playoffs. It, it hey, you know, once they get that losing. under control, yeah, once they get that under control, I mean, they did that even when I they were it. not that good of a team. They were scrappy and competitive. They used to get leads and they used to before we before I we blame move it on, on though, Robert, you guys, I blame it all on Robert Covington. <laughs> before we move on, um, what do you guys think about all the rumors of? Because this is the one off season where they will be able to bring in a big name. Uh, after this, you know they got to uh, re up Joel and re up Ben. But right now, this off season, <clears throat> they'll be able to bring right. in a big name free agent. Like, what, what do you guys see with it? Like, where, where would you go? You got the mute out there. You got Paul George, and of course the mute. You had to work a deal out. But where would you go with it? Mm-hmm. See, that's to see what a what a George George Paul. I, yeah, I think the best fit would George be mute, Paul. but mute is not a a free agent. So you're going to have to give up some pieces that you might not want to give up to get mute. Paul George, I think, is the second best fit because he's a beta character with alpha male skills. So he can come in, fall in line with the two young superstars that we already have, do his thing on a secondary level, you know, play defense, and and just be a very good upgrade at the position over Robert Covington. Then you have the rumors of LeBron James. Of course, LeBron James. That ain't hard to be in here. The best player in the league. I understand that. But I think LeBron just changes the dynamic of a situation too much and a lot of the Philly fans who are begging for it to happen are just enamored by the name, and they're not thinking about the power that the name wields. And they hear these reports, one of them that we're going to talk about later, LeBron, or, or we can get it in now, LeBron says on his next stage of his career, he wants to play off of the ball. Um, Chris Broussard got that from somebody who is in the know, quote-unquote, so a lot of Sixers fans are taking that and running with it. All right, for all you people who said he couldn't play with Ben Simmons, he wants to play off of the ball. Come on, man. Your nature <laughs> – there's another conversation I had with somebody earlier today, but your nature is your nature. And then when things get, you know, tough and these guys aren't doing it right, LeBron's going to be handling the ball. He's going to be, you know, doing so, what he does. He's not so, just going to change so, his statistical yeah. output – because yeah. he wants to come and not handle the ball because of Ben Simmons. Right, right. So people can believe so let's that. Talk, let's talk about that. Let's talk about mm-hmm. let's talk about that for a hot second, man. There's three ways to score, particularly with the individual we're talking about. Catch and shoot, drive to the basket, or post work. At this stage in his career, while LeBron James can still get to the rack better than almost anybody else in the league, why would he want to? Why would you want to spend so much time going to the rack and cutting, mm-hmm. taking body blows because you're the best. Hey, like, that doesn't make sense. And then catch and shoot, yo, LeBron can hit a J. LeBron can hit a J. He is nobody's 
catch and shoot play. Yeah, catch and shoot guy. So yeah. you can write that off. LeBron you can write that off. And post into his J's, and he has to, to dribble, dribble slowly. Into yeah. His J's. So, yeah. Yeah. So and for, for somebody that we don't I think want that any... particular report came out just because of the rumors that have been going around. I think. People put that I out saw, there just to make it juicier to everybody. Because now you got Lakers fans excited, like, ooh, that means Lonzo can stay. And then you got Philly fans excited, ooh, that means he can come and it won't disrupt what we're already doing. But Brian ain't running off somebody's ball. Yo. Yo. And I he can't post up J.J. Barea, so we know what he does in the post. So, come on. Get out of here. To me, back eight to me, um... <laughs> I I completely understand what Dev is saying in terms of a fit, and a, but for me, I'm like torn with the whole concept of LeBron James coming to either the Sixers or for that matter. And the reason I say that is because I sit and think about historically, like any any opportunity you have to get the quote unquote best player, and you don't really have to give anything up to bring in the best player. How do you not? Do? Now, with that being said, I understand there's context to everything. And That's a decent right. point. You don't want to That's like ruin. Point. You don't want to ruin. You don't want to ruin like what you have going or how how he fits. But it's just like it's just interesting to say <clears throat> you have the opportunity to get uh, a once in a lifetime player. Granted, I don't even want to say he's on the other side because LeBron's getting better in a weird way. Shout out to HGH. But um, it's <laughs> like how do you have an opportunity to bring in LeBron James and not have to give anything up? And you'd be like, you know what? No, nah, I like what we doing over here. But at the same time, I so it's like I have this constant fight in my head, like yeah, but you're building this, like so. I don't even know how I feel about it. Yeah, see, and that, and that's what I'm saying. Like, if somebody, if we could get the promise that you know LeBron off the court is not going to be LeBron. LeBron's not going to come in and just get your coach fired because he don't bang with him like that. Or LeBron's not going to come in and say, uh, I want a couple of my banana boat boys to come with me. Um, can I get? Dwayne Wade or can I get Chris Paul or can I get somebody like that like if LeBron in a perfect world like you said Jimmy because that's the point that I was going to yeah. get to I'm like I think I think Kawhi would be have to give anybody up because he's less of a personality but the point that I was definitely going to get to what Jimmy just said is like LeBron is a free pickup because they have the money to pick him up and just add him to the team and not have to get rid of any you know uh, core pieces, but I don't believe that LeBron would come to a place and not make you get rid of one of your core pieces, like a Dario Saric or somebody, just because he don't feel that's a good fit, and he has the power to do that. So this is not a diss to him. This is a compliment that he wields this type of power over the National Basketball Association. So you know, for all the fanboys out there who's like, oh, this dude is. Hating because he don't want LeBron. It has nothing to do with with that. It has nothing whatsoever to do with that. LeBron is the greatest player in the game today, and it's just different when you when when you're a fan of something and you sat through something for four or five years with the promise that this is going to be long term, and then we flirt with something like this, and we've seen what happens when LeBron goes in and out of. Um, organizations. You know, we get the, 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 the people out there who exaggerate the whole thing. Pause. Oh, LeBron comes and you win this many more games and he leaves and you and you do this. But the the bottom line of that is LeBron never comes alone and he never goes alone. So of course he's gonna come in like like with Cleveland. People forget the whole roster situation. People just say, Oh he but came you know to what, Cleveland and they went know, from the lottery to this. Okay, but he got their number one pick who was but, supposed but, to be there cornerstone for ages he got him thrown out he came in with kevin love they came you know another uh, few guys sprinkled in there they're already a great team and then when he leaves my thing is that real quick though it's just to, just to um um you know not necessarily play devil's advocate but to add another another layer to this uh this conversation i don't think he's ever walked into a situation quite like this though so all the places that we talked about he picked the right. team but he hasn't walked into a, what, a 50, to, 50, to a like, he hasn't walked this will be into his Kevin Durant moment. Yeah, because this is a <laughs> young team that's hungry you're and coming on the into a 52-win 52, 52 team who's well, already the young come up. 52-win young team. Yeah, so this is but, like but a then, bit different than all of them. It's like a seesaw, Jim. 
because that's a good point. And then when you express how young you are, and that's when you go back down on the seesaw, and you're like, that's more reason for him to just Brody these dudes. <laughs> because and they're also, so young. It makes me, it and Ben makes Simmons me, is a is, something is, else is a, that's. <laughs> and Joel also, what scares me about that is Ben Ben Simmons is a young boy. Joel is a stand of LeBron. Like, do they do they? Because the one thing I like about both of those guys is they seem to have hunger and attitude. Um, right. Do they kind of refer too much to him because oh well LeBron's here? Like, I believe they, they would. I believe they would also become friendlier because when you're out on the road and LeBron's friendly with the rest of the league, they can't go out there with the attitude that they've had. You know what I'm saying? Because now at this point, yeah, LeBron like, is my home. Hands, look. Can't be acting. Joel is a troll, and and Ben is like ready to throw hands every game. So right. it's like that's also scary too, right? Because I'm like, all right, so what LeBron, happens? LeBron, LeBron's gonna edge, come in. No, no, so that's, that's not that's not how conference. we do it. Let's hug. Let's make up handshakes. Let's go out for milkshakes after the game. It's all friends. It's all love. <laughs> it's all love, baby. So, so this is this yeah. is a, this is an interesting thing, right? Because like in any other year, any other team, you have an opportunity to get the best player, and it's like you don't even have this conversation. Right. But there's like there's so much new yeah. to it. It's kind of it's, it's, it's that's, crazy. And, and that's and that's all I try to tell people. There's a lot of context. There's a lot of nuances to this situation that's just not the normal situation. Shit, if I was Miami at that time, hell yeah, come on, LeBron. If I was Cleveland a couple of years ago, hell yeah, come on, LeBron. There's a little bit more nuance. To this situation is not just that easy, and people yo, are making it seem. Yo, I'm gonna call it. I'm gonna call it what it is. Our fanboys. I don't do the fanboy thing with anybody, so I have to think objectively about a lot of things like this. I'm gonna I'm call it what it is. Y'all afraid that y'all gonna see Ben Simmons, Joel and B, and LeBron James on a banana boat in the Caribbean. <laughs> And that would not be a sight that I'm trying to I'm trying to look at <laughs> wearing the same suit. Yo, man. It's all yeah, cool. I mean, y'all can wear my loyalty. Like my, I'm a I'm a Sixers fan. If it happens, then it happens. Then I'm rooting for my team. You know, point blank, bottom line. But I, I'm okay with what they're doing. You know what I'm saying? I think with or without LeBron, okay, the 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 run to the NBA finals that we're not guaranteed to win might start immediately rather than a year or two after, you know what I'm saying? But I just, you know, if, if it can happen without, you know, and he make his one or two year appearance without destroying the direction that the team was going in, then bring it on. But I still think, you know, history, even on the history, court, history tells us history that can happen. All right, yeah, well, but we'll, I mean, we'll and, and, and I think crazy. a lot of Sixers fans, this, this is just situation. about the team and the coach in general. Y'all gotta calm down, B. Like y'all let y'all let the y'all let the media hype y'all up. First of all, they go on a 17 game winning streak in a stretch that we all knew. Like like man, we we're glad we have this stretch because they made it through the early stretch of the season when the Sixers had the hardest schedule in the NBA. You know, they made it there with a good enough record to where it's like, okay, if we can run off, of, you know, a good number of these games at the end of the season against lesser competition, we could be in good shape. They went out there and beat them all. <laughs> Everybody got hype. Also, okay, Everybody the believed thing, the hype when all these uh, media pundits started saying the Sixers could end up in the in the finals this season or blah blah blah. So now that this young team went through their first growing pain and took an L, now everybody's out here you know, taking it harder than they would have taken it maybe a month ago before the hype train jumped out of the station and couldn't be controlled. So now everybody's having these think, super expectations. Like, these, a lot of these dudes were in their first playoff. A lot of these dudes were in their first full NBA seasons, period. So to be, like, upset with I think with a lot them, of this, um, a lot mm-hmm. of that also has to deal with the, uh, deal with the um, Eagles, honestly. It's like expectations of the city. Yo, they started yo, they started getting spoiled <laughs> right after this right after the Eagles, Villanova went and chipped up. So people start feeling like Yeah, we, chi- we, we, yeah we 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 tripping. We tripping. 
Yeah, Come on, y'all. You. He said, like, we got you in the chat room saying F.O. to the Brett Brown sympathizers. <laughs> so, okay, he, he's yeah, a, he's a like, West Coast Sixers fan. And I just think people are going a little too hard, even on the coach. I'm not saying he didn't make mistakes, but I'm like, why does he not get to not make mistakes when, you know, the players can get the excuse of being young and inexperienced. He's never been a head coach in a playoff situation before. He gets to learn just like the rest of them. He doesn't inherit the type of team that Steve Kerr inherited. You know what I'm saying? He didn't get the type of team that, Teron Lu inherited. So, the, you know, these are the guys, mm-hmm. his contemporaries who came in young, fresh, and went and won. He, he, you know, he don't have LeBron James and Kevin Durant and Steph Curry, Clay Thompson, and all those type of guys. He's working with guys oh, who so are the one thing, even less experienced than he is. Let the man make some mistakes. The one thing, you know, we also, we also have to mention that um, Meek is home. So, you know, a lot of this may be, uh, you know, he – he sacrificed himself for the Eagles and Zonova, but he's home now, so we don't know what's going on. Right, right, right. So when as soon as he got out of jail, we should have understood that it was over. It was a wrap. Yeah, so my man's texting me, and B. Austin, you know who this is, because he cannot talk and it not be in fanboy terms. He says whatever LeBron decides to do as far as he will dictate what players are around him, and it will be for the betterment of the squad. See, we say that we say that now because these are this is coming from people who think that no mistakes are made when their heroes are concerned. But it's not to the betterment of the squad that Justin Thompson has an eighty four million dollar contract. It's not to the betterment yeah, of the of the squad that J.R. Smith got the kind of money that he, he got. And LeBron damn near held out to get these dudes paid, but then midway through the season, he's telling the team, I need more help. So don't tell me it's about yeah, the betterment man of the squad when he gets these dudes, he brings them in, gets them paid, and then he tries to bail on them midway through the season, man. Like, for once in your yeah, life, yeah. be, be, be so effective for once it, in your life. I'm, I'm glad some people ain't my friends, man. I need friends to tell me when I'm out. Like, yo, you tripping right now. You, need, you don't need to do that. Yo. Like, these dudes is like, yo. everything you do is right. And here's Scott you. This, this, this particular... <laughs> Oh, be real this quick. particular person to, that you're referring Hold on, B, 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 hold on, hold on. Mm. He said FOH to be Brett Brown being a playoff novice. He sent under the tutelage of Popovich for years. He knows better. That, that's, that doesn't mean anything, man. Like, he sat under the Yo, tutelage not, of Pop in the first year. He got a team that was okay. He won 52 games. So, damn, he gets to the playoffs. It's also, man it's also, a, it's also a because he sat under Popovich? He's not popular. He sat under here. Yo, <laughs> and it's a difference between assistant. Like, Teron Lue was an assistant coach for, like, five decades under, like, everybody. <laughs> Doc River, you name it. I mean, I look at Jerome Allen now. He's, he's spying the Celtics bench. I don't expect him to come out and just keep Brad Stevens. Um, exactly. And, right. and even beyond that, I, I look at some of the great coaches, right, in our, in our league's history, whether it's like a George Carl or – or um, the, a lot of these guys, they, they, they go places and make mistakes. And, uh, you know, um, historically, a lot of them are better in their second go-round. And, right. and, and if, if that's sports, the case, by that logic, Jim, then what happened to uh, uh, Derek Fisher? He sat under and played under the tutelage. He had yeah. Bill Jackson for, damn near a decade and a half. What's his excuse? Yeah, I mean, like, things just don't work, work out like that. that. People make is, these games. You have to let things play out. But not even beyond that, I think I think it goes to something that we all talked about, and it, it's it's like a offshoot of the culture of immediacy. It's like we're just so quick to throw the baby out with the backwater. Um, to cliche with every Man. every game, every play, every minute, Man. it's like we're making complete judgments on stuff, and you just can't do that. Now, again, Brett Brown may end up being a piece of trash, but let's figure that out. Right, so but that didn't happen. Yo, and, and become yo, the coach ever. yo, it's like pl- yo, another it's playoff like, or two. It's like a if whole he doesn't prove to get better, then I'll be right there with you. But his first go around, it's like after a, they handed it's this like man a hundred million, barely win eight games. <laughs> it's like a hundred million Bill Waltons walking around, and like we knew that Bill Walton was just Bill Walton, so he got a pass. But like. Yo, everybody, he's the greatest yeah, thing that's, since that's sliced bread. 
That's with the worst. Point. No, so, and, he's the Dev, worst. Me and Dev talking. Me and Dev were talking off air. Like every shot LeBron makes or misses is a judgment on how uh, he fares against Mike. Yo, it's a stat. Forget, it's a stat. Who, who, every who, shot he makes or misses who, is a who statistic. <laughs> Yeah, it's like well, who's in front of him doesn't even matter. LeBron's playing ghost right now, yo. He definitely is. Um, let's, let's, let's stay on that. Let's stay on that. Now, I, somebody made a great point on our page earlier because it's like two or three different threads with the same conversation going on. That's And then when, you know, I know you guys are in a ton of other sports groups that you can see on social media, same conversation going on in those like 40, 40 times a day on different threads. Um, somebody made the greatest point uh, to me earlier today, and he said he's come to the conclusion that this is – nothing but a fanboy debate. And that's like the word of the week. And I saw, I sat back and thought about it. I'm like, that's true because, you know, you have people like us, especially me and Jimmy, because B. Austin's a, he's more of a mic stand than, than I ever was. <laughs> but you got people like us who really don't care. And after Jimmy wrote his book, I immediately subscribed to the, to the, um, the theory of the table of, God, God. Uh, the table of gods, because it makes so much sense. First of all, when you're arguing who's the greatest of all time in anything, football, basketball, uh, uh, getting yams, <laughs> getting money on the street, it's all subjective. Like, I can't sit here and tell Jimmy, Jimmy, Michael Jordan is the greatest player you've ever seen. How the hell am I going to tell that man who the greatest – player he's ever seen was. So I don't understand why these people do you know, Yo. have the same <clears throat> arguments day after day Greatest trying player to I've push seen their beliefs eye. on other people. Yo, I don't have like <laughs> whoever I'm talking to, whoever they think is the greatest at anything or the best right now or whatever, like I gotta respect it. It's their opinion. Like I'm not gonna like I may disagree and you may ask me and I may tell you something. And if you try to pick for more, I may expound on it a little bit, but I'm not going to sit here any longer. And I'm not going to say that I've never done this in my life because that would be a lot, but I've come to a point where I'm no longer going to sit here and have these knockdown drag out arguments with people about who some best player is uh, of all time. When everybody has a different opinion, I keep telling people this. You can sit 50 people in a room, just make sure that all 50, like, spread out through a bunch of decades. So there'll be some old dudes in there, some dudes a little younger than them. Then it just gets younger, comes all the way down to this generation. Just a bunch of people in a room from different generations. You ask the question, you tell everybody at the same time and just blurt it out. You ask everybody, who's the greatest basketball player of all time? You're going to get at least six or seven answers blurted out all at one time. You know what I'm saying? So if the guy next to yeah. me says Will Chamberlain, if his old head says Will Chamberlain is the greatest basketball player of all time, I'm going to sit here and say, Psh, no, he's not. You know that Michael Jordan is the greatest basketball player you've ever seen or LeBron is the greatest basketball player you've ever seen. Like, that's silly. And it's really it's too, it's too much, just dawning it's on me too now much how silly it is. <clears throat> right. And, and the fact that dude said that, like, this is a fanboy conversation because only fanboys – no one, no one's opinion is going to change. Going to beat you down with argument to make you a fan of my hero. This is, yo, this is the corniest thing I've ever seen. And, and, and here, here's, here's something I've been thinking about. I've been thinking about this a lot lately. You know, what makes me think about this is, um, you know, people like to joke a lot of times about the crazy statistics that come up for LeBron from ESPN, like the only person, you know, what I'm saying, um, who has two sons who scored this amount of points in this quarter. The clock. <laughs> but the reason I think a lot of that happens is another thing that goes into play is a 24-7 news cycle and then a constant competition and need to have fresh uh, ideas, bored, thoughts, man. and content 24-7. Because when you think about back in the day, there wasn't a 24-7 news cycle, so it wasn't the need to have constant content. Yeah. And now when, yeah. stories, when, stories break on, when stories break on Twitter and all that, like this is why you see like a lot of the ESPN hosts come up with, like, ridiculous topics just to get people talking. Um, like the topic of Brad Stevens, every NBA player, a lot, a lot of that has to deal with this. But then 
do add on to the fact that we have social media where we're having these, these debates every day, all day. It's like, yo, um, cats, a lot of times I'm looking, like I said, a lot of times I don't even get in the car, I look and read, I'm like, yo, you were up 3 a.m. I, when nobody's arguing back with you, now it's 6 a.m. and you're still up texting. I'm like, <laughs> I agree. I agree with you, but 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 also in the fanboy context of this, you got. I've never seen human beings make up more stats because of someone's futility in big moments. Like, but that's you can't seven, tell that's me. Also access to the data. You, you, you know, data it, it is. No, no, no. You're you're right. That contributes to it. That definitely contributes to it. But it's something more going beyond that. Like, people make excuses for LeBron, and they it, it's almost like because we're in a participation trophy generation, look how many times he made it to the finals. Yo, but he lost, cuz. No, but he made it. And, and he mean, participated. That's true. that's true. But it I definitely remember. goes both Listen. ways. Now, for Mike, I'm not saying it's excuses. For Mike, it's revisionist history. Like, people definitely revise history. And if they yeah, were just going to tell you the story of Michael Jordan, they act like he never made a mistake on the basketball court before. No, he never, he so it, never, it, he it, never it, missed a shot, on yo. Both sides. Mike shot 100% yeah. from the floor. But hold on, though. But the, um, <laughs> I, remember, I remember the first year I played fantasy, shot uh, fantasy that, football. He shot half that, about 50. When I played fantasy football, it was like 97. And, and at the time, like, the Internet wasn't what it was. And we would try to get, like, certain data. And there was a number where you can literally call the Elias Sports Bureau. And you would call them, and they would look stuff up and give you information, right? And I remember going through that a couple of times, mm-hmm. and it took forever. Now I can pick up my phone. I, can, I don't even have to type anything. I can press a button and ask my phone, hey, what's this? So I have access to so much information, which allows me to come up with these crazy um, statistical arguments just to, like fit my narrative, but I couldn't do that. You add that on to the fact that people are communicating 24-7, and now people have a platform to show their fan. People have to just become fanboys, but now you have a platform to show their fanboyism, and then you end up with what we have, which is just like a hodge that's the community read. So it's like, it's just, it's just way to control, but it, it's just, I just like the idea of every play, every night, like making this, people making these huge, just like just time. statements like, about what things are. Oh my God! I'm like right crazy. now, you know, it is LeBron James's time. Can I sit back and enjoy LeBron James's time just like I enjoyed Kobe's, like I enjoyed Mike's, you know, like I enjoyed the tail end of uh, Magic, Bird, Doc, and all them kind of dudes? Like, can I sit back and enjoy it? And be happy, clap, congratulate this dude Look, every Look, time he makes a bucket. The, we gotta bring up Michael Jordan, Look, and it's the same way on the other LeBron side. Is the greatest, LeBron, LeBron is the greatest. LeBron is the greatest. Is the greatest. It's, 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 you gotta be fair. It's the same on the other side. Every time LeBron misses a shot, here come the Jordan stands out of their hole. Mike oh, wouldn't have done that. Yeah. Mike wouldn't have missed that. Mike would have took that shot. Mike wouldn't have passed. Like yo, see, everybody shut and, and here, up. Yo, and here, y'all and probably here's the debating two about dudes it, right? who probably laugh, ain't even the top two dudes in NBA history. <laughs> and what I laugh, what I make me laugh about the whole situation, specifically when it comes from the Mike fans, and I guess it's because of my age and I, I, I like more of the people you know are Mike fans. I see the LeBron fans, but the Mike fans, which makes it funny to me, is they make these um they make these assertions about LeBron based on every play, but I'm like the fact that you keep coming up with that is proving how great he is. Like. And Kevin Durant he makes is a shot. You don't say Jordan wouldn't have done that. Like you don't even bring Jordan up. But for everything LeBron does, you want to bring up what Mike would have done. Like by you doing that, you're putting him on the same pedestal. You know what Let I mean? Let me like, read the post. Exactly this is true. to that conclusion. And I'm not going to say his name because I don't know if he want his name said on the air. But he said, I've come to the conclusion that this debate is fruitless. It's all apples and oranges. Kobe, Jordan, LeBron, Chamberlain, and on. They were all different players with different individual attributes which made them one of a kind. Each was dominant, each first ballot Hall of Famers, each included in any rational debate. The debate is for fanboys. The reality, LeBron is the best playing alive. So was Jordan. So was Wilt, Shaq, Isaiah Thomas, on and on. The debate is tired. Let's acknowledge these guys are all in their own league and aren't really comparable to any other player. And I, I told him, I was like, man, I, can't, I couldn't agree more. Because I'm like, 
I have, like, everybody develops favorites. But as a man, <laughs> first and foremost, as a man, I can't bring myself to slobber all over guys like some of these dudes do for their favorite players. I can't do it. I can't do it. Like, we got a homie. <laughs> we got a homie that me and Jimmy went to high school with. And shout out to you if you're listening. Like, he's supposed to be a Sixers fan. If you look at his feed throughout the Sixers game, all he's doing is posting about LeBron all throughout the Sixers game. Like, I had to ask him a few times, like, are you really a Sixers fan or, or what? Two, 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 literally two seconds after the buzzer last night. We need to bring in LeBron. <laughs> like, it, it, it gets, it gets uh-huh. tired because it's come to a point now, like, if you don't agree that the Sixers should be begging for the services of LeBron James, then you're, you're a joke. You're not a real fan and this kind of stuff. Like, I can't bring myself to be on nobody's wood that damn hard. I can't. It's just not in my nature. So it's like for all of these dudes that I know who are either Mike or LeBron stands, Kobe stands included, everybody, who anything that happens with their guy, like they're sending me texts or they're tagging me and stuff and all that kind of stuff, please stop. No <laughs> please human stop. being all, do should this do this. that. There's nothing that these guys tag me in or send me that I haven't already seen, for one. I'm on the internet all day. So it's like, you're not proving anything to me because I'm not a LeBron hater. But in a lot of categories, and I tell you guys this all the time, if you don't agree with them that we should all be on our knees, you know, massaging his wood, like you can, I can say to anybody, like, yo, LeBron James is one of the greatest players I've ever seen. <laughs> But if I don't say to them he's the greatest player I've ever seen, then I'm a hater. <laughs> I told you know, y'all that. Funny you know, I've, been, all, I've been called a LeBron lover and a LeBron hater in the same conversation by different people who got into the conversation at different points. All, all the people have been called a lover and a hater in the same conversation. How does that work? <laughs> yeah. Oh, that man. Work? Yeah, so this this stuff is cool. crazy. Oh, this is, oh my! Oh, and, but this is this is tired. And this dude is a hundred percent correct, man. This is nothing but a, a f- at this point. Um, let's get to Tobias because you know he always in the chat cursing at me like like you dudes can't answer the phone. <laughs> Tobias, what's fuck, up? You're in the room, fuck, Tobias. Hey. Thanks I had to waiting. say N words be hey N words be at work B. That's all I got to say, man. What's going on, fellas? <laughs> hey, nothing, man. Hey. We just sitting here showing how things. annoyed we are with this whole LeBron Michael Jordan thing. Every time LeBron makes or misses a shot, somebody gotta you know, take shots at each other. I'm like, first of all, why we gotta tear one down to make the other one look better when all of these dudes that's all about the, stand on their own all, with the stuff that they do. And you know what? Here's the thing. I'm going to tie this in. What I'm about to say, and like my dad taught my dad, you know, he was down today. And I was like, look, Joel B, I like him, but he is the epitome of today's NBA, where the big man who has a physical and skill advantage over his man takes away his own advantage by trying to be Kyle Corbin or Dirk Nowitzki. And, uh, mm-hmm. and I think that is a problem because you got all these big men out here who have great post game, like, even like Boogie Cousins. He want to take six threes a game. That why do that if you have an advantage down low? And I believe that. And to me, when you have that presence down low, that will actually help your wing players get looks. It also put the other big men in foul trouble as well. Well, the refs didn't want to call no fouls last night, but that to me that that <laughs> um. Come, come, come think about it. How easy is to guard Joel Embiid when he's out there wanting to jack up threes instead of having him in the post? And to me, that yeah, is what maybe. some of these Because at that big point, it's like, do. okay, either he's going to miss or he's going to make it. Like, you got a much better chance that he's going to miss it, considering he shoots like 26% from the three-point line. And, <laughs> and if he makes it, you shake his hand. That's all he can do. That's what you want him to do. But, but like, this whole LeBron debate, right, I listen to some of these guys we've been having on at work. It's like they changed the narrative. It's like, like my cousin. He's 22. I said, dude, I expect you to think LeBron's the best. That's the only guy you saw, <laughs> you right. know. Uh, and so, and so uh, we grew up in a generation where we saw players from Magic and Bird to their prime to now LeBron in their prime. 
that is like a privilege I don't think many people thought of in our age group. But also, people don't factor in the yeah, era. Everybody, Tobias, are so ready and willing to pit these guys against each other that they're missing out on a lot of greatness. Like, a lot of people hated Kobe so much. They just, you know, you're missing out every night because every time you watch him, you're angry. But he's entertaining you. But you're, you're too angry to, to, to get a good look at it. Like, it's the same you with know, his, no, LeBron. He's polarizing like that. Here's the thing. Here's the thing that kills me. It like, see, the thing with eras, it's not just so I'm knocking you on your butt. It's also that you had big men. So LeBron won't go guard one through five in Jordan's era because he knocked on guard and came a larger one. Let's just call yeah. it what it is. But it's not a knock against him. I and, mean, it's uh, an that's how the game changed. LeBron guards one through five now, but I get your point. <laughs> yeah, and so what happens is now there's a less physical game. Now, Calher, I give him Craig called a cardio league. So it's less physical, so you got the more ball dominant players. And now you don't have that physical toll now. See, then you had a more physical toll, and I give LeBron credit on that. But he wanted the ones that say, let's get more rest. Let's get more time off between games. No more than four and five nights. You know, things like that, which actually helps the players. But I do, but I, I just hate it when they had these made up stats that we never heard of before. Like like they had one time most fadeaways in a playoff game. I don't still wonder how no. the hell Clay Thompson had seven. I never seen him take a fadeaway ever. I didn't fell out my seat. I didn't even fell out yeah. my seat when I saw that. Most fadeaways <laughs> in a playoff game, and people were posting it like, "Yo, Brian, that dude, he got the most fadeaway." I thought we were always taught really that fadeaway wasn't a good shot, but then you know Michael Jordan made it popular. <laughs> Kobe took it to, to the next level. <laughs> And now, the LeBron yeah. now we're gonna and start counting. LeBron again. shot the most fadeaways. Yes, he's <laughs> not. He's not. He shot the most fadeaways. Yep. And, and you know, and the thing is about him though, and like you guys are right about the Tristan Thompson and J.R. Smith. He had and like Kenya Martin. I love Kenya Martin on TV because he be going at coward. He be checking him. I love Kenya Martin. <laughs> you know, but. He was like, okay, LeBron, where are you going to go? He get everything he want already. He pretty much run the organization. If they want to get rid of somebody, he wants to get rid of somebody, they do it. They want to sign somebody, they do it. His homies to come by, they'll do it. Where else are you going to go that'll give him that? And see, it, it, and, and you but know, that's the thing. I'm I don't not think it's just Cleveland. I think at this point, Tobias, I think everybody will bend to LeBron's whim like that. Because if you take on LeBron and right that's, now, that's what I was you have to I understand was gonna say, where's LeBron that you're go on what I call – yeah, I, I, exactly. You're on – if you take on LeBron right now, you're on what I call his legacy schedule. Like I said, LeBron not playing against, you know, a lot of these dudes in the league anymore. LeBron is playing for legacy. So he's doing everything. He doesn't want to win a championship now. He wants to win championships yesterday. Because he knows in this godforsaken debate that a lot of people out there are going to keep dropping the mic um, because he has lost so many championships. If he can you know, have, if he can have eleven appearances and even get within one championship of Mike, I think he would consider it a, a success. And you're, if you're going to take on LeBron, you have to take listen, on the back. Here's, here's the thing. Here's the thing, gentlemen. Um, LeBron James is standing on the shoulders of John. The reason he's able to do the things he wants to do is because of a Dr. J, because of a Magic, because of a George. Yep. So he, he recognizes that he has the power as the face of the league, and he leverages that power. That's, it's interesting to me to see. I made a comment a couple of weeks ago. I was telling Dev that LeBron is probably my favorite athlete of all time, but that's like off the court just because of the way that he's able to use his platform and, and what he's done. In terms of empowering his friends and family, in terms of the way he, um, you know, he's, he's more progressive in terms of uh, social um, social uh, activities than, than a lot of athletes, and he's built a, a huge business. Now, with that being said, it, it makes me wonder what happens after LeBron. If LeBron is able to see that he can leverage that, what are the younger guys doing? What's going? You want to have guys um, in maybe ten years who are like, look, this is the schedule that the league is playing. And if y'all don't like this, I'm not going to play. But Kevin won't take it too far. Um, yeah. I just don't know what the future holds. Um, you know what I'm saying? It's interesting so, because, uh, like, what Ben Simmons, Ben Simmons is like, um, when you watch him play, it's very reminiscent of that. Um, 
So, you know, we may have uh may have this on our hands in Philadelphia. So uh, right. someone the next guy plus he, on the plus, show is the I mean, Giants. He, like, he's he learning from all of them dudes that, that Jimmy just talked about. Yeah, yeah, he is, and he definitely he he's definitely leverage touch down with that. I, I, I'll say these two quick things. I know y'all guys got to run. It's like, one, like you said, learn from Jordan. You remember Jordan's last couple years in Chicago? He was underpaid. He said, look, you give me 30 $35 million and I'll retire. And the Bulls are doing that. And I think LeBron oh got to the page from that. Especially LeBron took a page from that. Because I never thought him was taking those one-year deals in Cleveland, just keeping those one-year deals. But I want those people who keep saying that they, the organization, they spent the most money in NBA hits the highest luxury tax bill. They did their part. But I'll say this right. also to the Shea Sharps out there who keep saying that Michael Jordan did nothing that Scottie Pippen showed up. As a resident Bulls fan here, it took Scottie Pippen a hard grant four years to mature as players. Just like Philly, they were mature as players. Really <laughs> yeah, because they don't give now, Jordan any credit for like, his tutelage of Scottie to even make Scottie stop being so scary and, and getting the full extent of his talent out there. I mean, you remember how people like so hard greasy hard. about Scotty? Like, oh, don't worry about them. We're going to have Scotty Hart by game two. Like, they used to kill Scotty. But and you people, know what else? You know, act like uh, he it, came in with a cape on and just saved Michael Jordan's career. More revisionist history he, just on the other side of it. Because you got to mature. Cause like, look at Philly's players. The talent's there, but you got to mature as players like the adversity. Because you're going against grown right. men. Right. A lot of cases. Microwave so, society, so Tobias. Have, people don't give you a chance to mature these days. Yeah, and, they don't uh, even give you a chance this. to play. Like, Your man played 14 games. He already a bust. <laughs> and you know what? And like, I'll, I'll give folks one more like a year, see how he does. Hell, he's on a cheap contract, so if he ain't that good, you ain't paying him a whole lot of money. <laughs> so here's that, that's the thing. So, and, but but I believe Philly's on the way up. I, I want go. Everybody, told me, you gotta add this player, add that player. I don't want these pundits making this front office go crazy and make dumb decisions. They have the two cornerstone pieces. Once their games mature, they get like Sarge. His game matures. And all you need is a shoot like another wing player who get his own shot. He doesn't have to be the best wing player in the league. He just needs to be a guy who like a Bradley Beal on a cheaper contract type guy. Uh, that him. type of guy. They, they might have him if they let this boy's shoulder heal and his mind get right. They might have him. Yeah, but I got a feeling. Yeah, that's all. If they get offered one of these stars from another team, then he might be packaged, you know, to go. Because I, I don't oh, think oh, Brian oh. Colangelo has. Brian Colangelo is already playing with. I ain't gonna say house money. He's playing with hinky money, so I think he definitely <laughs> wants to a move that will get him from up under that. Because a lot of Sixers fans who believe in the process, you know, they still tout Sam Hinky for for starting this whole thing in the first place. I think Brian he, uh, Brian Colangelo will quickly make a move and jump to one of these situations just out of haste, so they could possibly compete for a championship, and he could say he did it. So, and you know what? I'll know. say this real quick, and I and my last thing. My thing is is that when people like make these hasty moves, it never works. And sometimes it's like, uh, everyone, oh, Danny Ainge got over on Philly, got Jason Tatum. No one knew Jason Tatum was going to be good this good this year. It wasn't like he'll pass it on Tim Duncan here. You know, <laughs> and I swear you man, Danny Ainge just be getting lucky because I have it on good authority that they wanted to pick Jackson from Phoenix. But that whole thing that happened when they were flying all the way last minute to Sacramento to go see him and he canceled the meeting while they were in the air, it, it turned them off. So, you know, but they picked Tatum they picked the genius because they told people, Oh, that's who we wanted from the start. That's why we moved back because we knew we could get him at three. Blah blah blah. Like, okay, Danny, we we can't hey. prove you otherwise. So you look like the dude in the situation. Danny Ainge was going to trade four picks, Rogier anyway. and uh, another of those dudes who did well in the series was going to be picks that he was trying to tra- trade for Justice Winslow. So it's like, and, and <laughs> something happened where it didn't go through. So the stuff that doesn't happen makes you look like a genius. He was about to blow this whole team up for Justice Winslow. <laughs> hey, but, but, hey, but you guys have a good, hey, you guys have a good one. And you Sixers fans, I'll leave y'all with this. 
It could be worse. You guys could be a Bulls fan like me. They're going to give light-skinned Zach Levine, you know, but a light-skinned dude who could jump high, a Max Steele probably. Hey, at least <laughs> it could be worse. Right, man, <laughs> hey, you guys take it easy. All right. Hey, he, question. Killed, he killed Zach Levine. Yeah, he be killing him all the time. Quick question before before we move on, man. Did y'all see the, the conversation between Chuck and Kenny? Not Chuck and Kenny, Chuck and Shaq. They were arguing about the Toronto Raptors situation because um, Charles Barkley was basically saying moving forward, he thinks Dwayne Casey, um, who might be on the hot seat after coaching to their best season win loss, you know, wise ever, um, to continue on with that franchise as is, he's going to have to repair his relationship with. Um, DeMar DeRozan, because he did bench him at the, you know, at the later stages of one of those games. And of course, they ended up not winning the game. Um, do y'all agree with that? Because Shaq vehemently disagreed. And then the conversation got personal. And he's telling Chuck, man, you don't know what it takes, you know, to, to, um, to win a championship and stuff like that. Things that I thought actually had no bearing on the conversation whatsoever. Um, it was just another That's uh, he was trying to win. He was trying to win from. an argument. Trying to win an yeah. argument as opposed so you to just go personal real point. with it. Like, no. See, and, and that's the difference. That's another difference from then and now. Like, I, I, I wouldn't say Chuck didn't know what it took to win a championship. I say Chuck ran into that man that <laughs> most of the superstars from that day ran into. So, you know, if you were there on the cusp and you ran into the common denominator, you know, I don't think it was about not knowing what it takes because those Bulls teams were 6 and 0. <laughs> so you're going to say nobody back then knew what it took but that's a whole different thing but Shaq went there with it but do y'all agree with Shaq or do you agree with Chuck because Shaq, Shaq was basically saying no he doesn't have to repair his relationship you know you don't have to baby these guys he wasn't playing well so he got sat down the reason I ask you guys because nah. it's kind of interesting because when in the game during this Philly Boston series when TJ was playing so well and he ended up bringing Ben back into the game during that one point game a lot of people were saying that then saying no that's your that's your star that's your up and coming star he has to be on the court and I was like well not necessarily and I, and this was before the DeRozan thing I was like I think if it was an older player who's already an established star in the league then you might owe him more. You know, he might have to be out here in the situation, but this is a learning experience for Ben as well. And sitting on that bench is going to want to, it's going to make him want to get better and not be in these positions as his career goes on. So then after I had that conversation then the whole thing happened with DeRozan and then Shaq and Barkley started arguing. And I'm like, that's interesting because <laughs> I probably can't backtrack on what I said now. So it's like, how would that, you know, how do y'all feel? The situation did he owe the does he owe the rosen an a, a, a honest attempt to repair their relationship going forward or is it like look i'm the coach you were playing like trash i sat you down it's over um what's your thought on that yeah no nah, i think you i think you have to mend that fence because in order for the good of the team and the growth of the player you want to constantly keep that, that line of communication open and, and have that relationship be a part of the foundation of any f- future success that's going to happen there. So I, I think Dwayne Casey has to reach out to, to DeRozan and, and, and they need to talk and, and, about and, that. And I'm not even saying – I don't even think it was the wrong decision. I don't even think it's the wrong decision. I think he just owes him a conversation. Yeah. And, and I and I agree with that. I mean, because it it's a working relationship and everybody's adults. Maybe if, you know, this is college or high school or something like that, then maybe you don't owe that guy that type of thing. But this is the NBA where the players make more money than the coach. Um, of course, when, when people start being expendable, the coach is going to be the first one to go. I think you have to mend that fence, too, only because, you know, DeRozan and Lowry might not be superstars the way that the people in Toronto – think or or want them to be because they're not they're they're on a different tier than some of the other guys in the league bottom line is that's all they have so if he's your best player 
you don't want that relationship to be contentious moving forward because, one, it could cost you your job. And, two, you know, it could just mess up chemistry. Like players, I've seen players sulk and mope and sabotage stuff, you know, just to, to, to get the coach up out of there. And the players are your conduit, especially in today's NBA when, you know, your star players are out here recruiting come free agency time, you need your best player to vouch for you. Yeah, I love my coach, this and that. So I, I, I especially, think wrong in especially in Toronto where the tax situation means that people are going to get a little, little less money to come up there anyway. <laughs> right. So, no, yeah, I agree. First off, they're probably and I agree with Charles Barkley. I agree with Charles Barkley on that one. And I said, first off, it shouldn't be a team in Toronto like that trash to begin with. But second of all, um, <laughs> uh, we go, like, hey Jim, in five Shaq, years Shaq, we're gonna be saying that about London. First of all, it shouldn't be a damn team in London. <laughs> yeah, Shaq, Shaq <laughs> got real personal, and I mean, I don't even like the way that whole thing went off. Like again, these next day we're brothers. We always argue. I get that. Yo, like, it's it's, I mean, it's Dan, hard we to it. it's hard to you can sell Shaq it's hard real. to not like, like he Shaq. He wasn't even smiling anymore when it, he was saying that stuff. It, mm-hmm. It's it's hard to not like Shaq, and I'm and I'll be the first because I take shots at Shaq, but I don't really dislike dude. Like he's so personable and funny, but dude is a little corny, and 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 he will go below the belt, and he definitely supports police and supports Momia being in jail. So he is the type of corny yeah. dude that'll go at someone yeah. in the wrong way. Uh, so, just so we just so we know the, where it is. So he did it. Like he could he could have let Chuck make his point, waited for him to finish and then made his counter. And like the whole way he handled it, they trying to talk over exactly. him and kinda of whacked to me. Exactly. It's like dog. It's like you know, he got said, really passionate about like which was a nonsense topic though. He got that passionate over a topic that really wasn't even that deep. Right. Scabby in the chat room said that's why you have the title coach. Casey was doing what he's paid to do, which is coach. He said if the Rosen had the power that Magic did against Pat Riley, then yeah, he needs to patch it up. But no, I I, I kind of disagree with that because I, I did make that point. Like it could cost you your job, and I think that last thing I just read that's more aimed at his job. But it's not even just about the job, and you know, the, being the reason that he needs to patch it up. It's it's, it's the fact that. And it might not be a great thing that DeRozan is your best player, but the best player and the coach, and I'm not saying to baby him. I say like Jimmy or, or B, one of y'all just said, like just have a conversation, have a man-to-man conversation with him, air it out, you know, let him know what the deal is, but don't ignore the situation. That could be the worst thing that, that he could possibly do. And like I said, not even just for his job, just for the team moving forward, for morale, for chemistry. For all of that kind of stuff, because for better or worse, he's your best player. And I guess these, you know, kind of for worse. <laughs> if you got to cater to a dude like the Rosen, I don't want to diss him. But like I said, they're just on a lower tier than I think the people up there in Canada want to look at them like they're first tier superstars. And, and they prove to you year after year in the playoffs that they're not. They but um, they on a lower tier than Drake than Drake wants them to be. Drake wants yeah. a LeBron level star that he can nut hug. And instead he got the he got the nut hug <laughs> Kyle Lowry and DeMar DeRozan. Hey, look, um, man, if you, yeah, if you got an equity if you got if you got a small piece of equity just to sit court side, you do it too. <laughs> True. Casey Mack got a um question in the um War Room Sports Game Time group on the group me app. He says, what does Boston do now with the emergence of Rozier and Tatum? Not enough minutes when Kyrie and Gordon come back. Predictions. Um, I predict Gordon might end up getting traded. Uh, His coach might try to loosely fight it, but he probably knows what the deal is here. I'm only saying that because that was his college coach as well. But I don't think he's going to stick his neck out to, to keep him around. I think they might end up trading him. Or... Sometimes it's a very good problem to have that kind of depth, especially exactly. when Tatum. And if you're smart, you wouldn't trade Gordon right now because you want to see if Tatum can duplicate this. You know what I'm saying? And the fact that you'll have the deepest team in the league because your youngsters now got a chance to play in starring roles. So even if, you know, they got to go back to bench roles for a little while, it'll shake out. 
whether or not Tatum is already better than um, uh, Gordon Hayward by the time he comes back. It'll all shake out, and I think Brad Stevens will make the right call and do the right thing. But people are asking these questions. I think it's a great problem to have because, you know, Tatum, Brown, those dudes are still on rookie contracts. So why rush it now before you know for sure that they're going to be able to duplicate this year after year? One thing we know about Gordon Hayward, he might not be the superstar. Like, it didn't make that big of a splash when he signed in Boston. But the fact that he got hurt and gave these young dudes a chance to play, adding him to the mix, come on, man, that's a championship team right there. So I wouldn't be hasty about it. (laughs) Be deep. It's it's funny funny because, like, in the the words of – who said this? Um, I think it was Shaq, and he said the Sixers and Celtics are going to be going at each other for the next four to five years, maybe ten. Which I find hey, how are you jump from four to five to all? They skipped, they skipped another but, five, six years. But <laughs> as the Sixers, when you see them having Kyrie and go come back, that's another reason that you know. And I know that um, uh, Tobias was saying, don't just rush to make a move as uh, the Sixers um front office, but. Uh, this is the one year where you're going to be able to make that move. Like, just, and it's how things shake out because you got to re up Ben, you got to re up Joel. So you this got is to run off season think, to make a big splash. This is why I still think it has to be one of the other two guys, Paul George or Kawhi Leonard, because more likely than not, if those dudes sign, they're going to sign for at least four or five years. You know what I'm saying? We yeah. know LeBron's not doing that. LeBron is going to sign a two-year contract at most, and he's going to leave an opt-out clause for after the first year. So it's like, say he does come. You get some chemistry. He decides he wants to leave. Then, <laughs> then you're – I mean, you, you still have the talent that you had on the team, but now you're working for the third year in a row with a different set – with a different chemistry set. And – it's just a lot of context and nuances that go into it. But, you know, whoever – if they if they jump out there, you know, whoever of the three you can land, I'll be supportive. But but I will throw the warning out there. LeBron is the greatest player um, uh, in basketball, but he comes with some stuff. I, I, I think that LeBron shouldn't even be a consideration – I, I understand why you're saying you always take the shot to get the best player in the world, but yo, he, I, it's almost guaranteed that he won't be there longer than two years. And it's like, yo, that really could set the franchise way back, way back. So, I mean, that depends. I mean, on I need Paul. He, if yeah, he gets say, anybody up out of there, there like Jimmy said, yeah, you because I don't, see, I don't right see him. Yeah, I don't see him gutting the team. No one can set him back. Um, but you know another thing he might do, be- Jim, even though he's given them, you know, more than anybody could ever give Cleveland, he might still look out for them on the way out. Let's do a sign and trade. And then we got to give something up. Set him co- give him Covington. <laughs> but if he do, if he asks for a sign and trade, then I'll just tell him to go. Like, no. You gave Cleveland anything that anybody could give that city. Like, you gave them enough. Like, you don't have to look out for them on the way out again. Just let them burn your jersey and let's just go. But, um, stat of the week real quick. Yo, Wait, yeah, he, God, can have, he can have he can have Robert Covington even if he just signed in as a free agent. We still – no, no, no. Y'all can have Robert. Y'all can We're going to skip these, these grind topics. We're just going to do stat of the week. Um, I'll get some quick birthday shout outs and Jimmy can get us right into some more NBA talk so we can talk about the conference finals. <laughs> we can't not get to this stuff two weeks in a row. Jimmy and I never got to it last week because of some technical difficulties. But um Y'all real fail. quick and while we're on the, the Toronto Cleveland series, um <laughs> the stat of the week revolves around DeRozan, Lowry, and LeBron James. Um, like I was saying before whatever tier you think Lowry and DeRozan falls in, uh, me and B got an inside joke because uh, one time we were playing in the league and somebody told us that our brother and War Room Sports partner, co-founder, Akil Bayon, he told us that our team, first of all, you know, they, they said we were a bunch of ringers in this league. 
because um, B. Austin, myself, and maybe one other dude, we weren't a part of the organization that the league was built around. Then you add on to the fact the respect that they show to our brother Akil. One dude said, look, you got them dudes, and then you got Akil, who's the equivalent of two NBA players. <laughs> So, uh, <laughs> admit, you know, first of all, like, oh, my God. like, like Hill has never been to the NBA, first of all. So I don't know how he could be the equivalent of two NBA players. <laughs> they had really high praise for, for, for Hill in this organization. But shout out to that. That reminds me, uh, you know, this out of the week reminds me of that because in that series, LeBron James pretty much – gave you equal production as DeMar DeRozan and Kyle Lowry combined. Now, the point count, LeBron James, 136 points in the series. Lowry and DeRozan combined, 138 points in the series. LeBron James, 33 rebounds. Lowry and DeRozan, 30 rebounds. LeBron James, 45 assists. Hey, Lowry and DeRozan, 46 assists. LeBron James shot 57 for 103 from the field. Lowry and DeRozan, 53 for 108 from the field. Now, if y'all want to call yourself all-stars and frontline superstars and, you know, you even got the right to be mad at your coach for sitting you down, come on. Y'all got to take a look at this and, and, and realize that LeBron James is equivalent to Kill Bayon. He's two NBA players. So, uh, shout out to yeah. that. <laughs> shout out to the week. Yo, Real shout out to Bum Non wherever you Bum Non wherever you are for saying that, yo. And I know why Dev and I were offended because of our egos, because we both thought we was better than the kill. <laughs> and so we was offended <laughs> with love and respect. I was like, that must make that must make me three NBA players to you, Bum Non. <laughs> no, I'm at least two in the corner. <laughs> Florida, yeah, stop, y'all. Y'all got a headache, and y'all making it worse, y'all. Y'all got. Yeah. But then you know, you know how B is, Jenny. We already got name names. Oh, man, we be putting everybody out there on the radio. Listen, Bumline is not his real name. Yeah, but oh, well, maybe you know it is. is. <laughs> y'all can check out our website <laughs> at ringshorts dot com. But if you want to call in and speak about any of these. Uh, NBA Conference Final Series that are coming up down the Digital Extreme Tech Hotline 323-410-0012. Press 1 when prompted, but if you're already listening from your phone, press 1 if you want to talk. And before Jimmy gets us into that, I'm going to just give some quick birthday shout-outs. Shout-out to you, Jerome Williams, a.k.a. Junkyard Dog. He turns My 45 birthday. today. Yay. Ronnie Cycli, uh before... Before Zoe and Shaq, he was the greatest center in Miami Heat history. Um, he got to be on the on the Wall of Fame or whatever they got there. Ronnie Sackley was that dude for a minute, and the ladies liked him too. So shout out to now Ronnie Sackley. Now, now he's he EDM. Now he's EDM. Uh, he's EDM DJ? DJ and producer in Miami. Yeah, from right, the Q, right, with Ronnie he's, from he's the man. He's the man uh-huh. in Syracuse. Yeah, shout out to Ronnie Sykley, man. He was he was a, he was a baller. I had his birthday, his rookie yay! card. Who else? Danny Shays turns fifty nine. I think Danny Shays got like a late run on one of them Chicago Bulls uh, championship teams. I think he snuck in a ring late in his career. Yeah, he got the wave. Um, shout out, he to got him. the wave to tell. Ain't Danny related to Dolph? Ain't that his son, a nephew or something? I don't know. Oh, Shout yeah, out to Shane. I don't know. My birthday. Yeah. I think he, I think he got somebody in the league. Shout, maybe it was Pop, Dolph. Maybe it was Danny. Too. Maybe it was Dolph. Shout out to Dolph. Shout out to Dolph. Shout out to young man. Shout out to young Dolph. <laughs> Shout out to young man Chris Berman. He turned sixty-three. My birthday. Yeah. And rest in peace. Shout out to the voice next to the voice, Pat Summerall, who used to bust it up with John Madden on the NFL. Telecast, you know, after yeah, his NFL Howard. playing career, of course. Um, he was born May 10th, 1930. He left April 16th, 2013. So we'd like to give a war room salute to all of these folks on their birthday. birthday. Shout out to you. We're about to get back into this thing of ours because the playoffs are heating up. I probably won't watch them anymore. You know how you do when, when you finally – Get a team in any sport that's good. 
and then they lose and you're salty, like you don't want to watch anymore. Like when the Sixers yeah, were trash, I watched every playoff game there was. <laughs> but it's now but now it's you, like. What? No, I was gonna say, could you? Uh, could you, I'm gonna need you to um, get us into this NBA rap. Okay, no doubt, I'll do that. But um, yeah. So when you when you're rooting for a team, like it takes so much out of you to watch one of their games. It's like what happens after that. It's like whatever, man. I'll I'll, I'll put this this doubleheader on. Might not necessarily look at the TV. Like I might be doing other stuff, decompressing and all that kind of stuff. And then after they lose for good, it's like man, I don't even want to watch any more basketball. But I'm pretty sure this will subside quickly because I definitely want to see what's going on in that Western Conference Final that they've been hyping up all season. So we're gonna talk about it. And the NBA NBA rap is brought to you by Digital Extreme Technologies. Do you or your business need a custom website? Well, for dynamic, professional, and most of all, affordable custom website solutions, you need Digital Extreme Technologies. No need to break the bank for an effective online presence. Top quality, results-driven websites at incredibly affordable prices. And yes, financing options are available. So just visit digitalextremetech.com or call 267-205-4203. And for discounted rates, be sure to tell them War Room Sports and Chip. Shout out to Curtis Blow. All right. Um, real quick, back to the Toronto Raptors. Dwayne Casey receives the NBAC Coach of the Year Award. Now, I don't think a lot of people understand this because the way you see it getting reported on social media by all the, you know, the, the self journalists, I think they think this is the official coach of the year award. Well, it is not the NBA C is the NBA coaches coach of the award. This is voted on. This might be more prestigious because it's voted on by your peers. So all of the coaches in the NBA vote, um, on this Coach of the Year award, whereas the official one is voted on by uh, sports writers, just like all the other awards and um, all that kind of stuff. So like I said, this might be more prestigious because it's coming from people who know the grind, who who are out there all the time. Dwayne Casey wins that, um, led the Toronto Raptors to a 59-win game, a 59-game uh, season. They won 59 games. I don't know what the hell I'm trying to say. Um, and that's the most wins that they've ever gotten in the history of the franchise. They, you smoking? They laid an egg in the second round against LeBron James and the Cavs again. Um, but that none of that goes into winning the award. The interesting part about this award is from the coaches, Brad Stevens, who led his team to 55 wins and a two-seed in the Eastern Conference after – his top two players got injured, and then a lot of other players were in and out of the lineup throughout the season. He got zero votes from his peers. So I don't know if that's like, you know, the coaching fraternity. Like, that must wait be, your turn, that must young be buck. personal. Yeah, like wait your turn, young buck, or they may not like the, the, the attention that he gets in the media right now because, you know, the G words have been thrown around with him. Brad Stevens is a genius. I've heard plenty of people say Brad uh, – Stevens is unequivocally the best coach in the NBA right now. You know, the Murray Society doing what they do. Maybe some of these coaches got offended by that. I have a strong feeling that Brad Stevens is going to win the official award, but he got zero votes in this one. Do y'all think the coaches voted for the right guy? Um, Try not uh, to take this part of the into consideration. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, hard, yeah. it's hard. It's hard to do that. It's hard to do that. Like when you, when you just, when you just talk, it's hard, man. Pause. Like, but um, I, he had a good. It's, it's, to me, there's a lot of coaches this year that kind of that, that um, the gentleman in Utah. He had an amazing um year. I mean, even Brett mm-hmm. Brown had an amazing year. Um, it's a lot of deserving candidates I, for that one right there, man. I'm more likely to agree with coaches than sports writers, but it's funny when you put into context the possibility of a little bit of hate and jealousy because all human beings are, are human are human beings and subject to emotion. But I, I, I think they got it right. 
I think they got it right. I have a problem with Brad Stevens not getting any vote for it. That kind right. of I, I, I think is a little the official, weird. The official AP, whatever it is, that one that they're going to announce at the uh, NBA Awards, I think the votes on that one, I mean, I think he's going to get the bulk of them, Brad Stevens, that is. But I think, yeah. you know, there will be more votes spread around in that. Because just like Jimmy said, it will be criminal if – Quinn Snyder, Brett Brown, Dwayne Casey, um, guys like that don't get at least a few votes. Right. You know what I'm saying? Not enough to win right. the thing, but they got to right. get at least a few votes. Right. In this but whole you thing. know, you know, you have to you have to take into account the fact that Boston lost their top two star star players. Um, One no of them, disrespect to Al Horford. To Al Horford, but it's like I would think that an NBA head coach would be able to appreciate how difficult that is, or maybe they're telling us it's not that difficult. I don't know which, but that's a little interesting. He got no votes. Yeah. Yeah, they can say that all they want, but if Lowry and DeRozan, like, they ain't shit with them dudes. Imagine if they went down. <laughs> like, imagine if they went down. Toronto ain't making that kind of run. Toronto would have folded. Hey, and then Brett Brown, he had to do what he did without his best player for some significant time. Um, he didn't have his best player on back-to-backs for, for a good portion of the season, and then he lost him for the last 10, 10 games or so of the regular season. Um, he really never had his number one pick, which was supposed to factor greatly into the success of the team. So, you know, he, he did a pretty good job as well until – you go head to head with a coach like Brad Stevens, and then everybody sees your deficiencies, and everybody's calling for your job after five minutes. But um, shout out to Casey for getting the respect of his peers. The funny part, the, what's even more ironic, is that Casey is now in the hot seat because there's been reports that Toronto is thinking about moving on, and it's one of those things where it's not that he isn't doing a good job, but Toronto has bigger goals right now. I think they're getting frustrated with getting, you know, a top two seed in the playoffs every year and then flaming out badly against the same team and the same player in the playoffs. So I don't know what switching the coach would do for that mind state because you're still going to have the same players. Um, But something got to give, and I hope it's not Dwayne Casey's job. Um, Skyview was like, didn't the Atlanta Hawks coach get coach of the year? He did win that a few years ago when they won 62 games. Um, Budenhoser, yeah. um, I think he's been relieved of his duties since then as well. So it's a hard world out here, man. It's a hard world out in these NBA coaching streets. All right, let's get to the to the series. Um, and we got the big one out west. We got the two-seeded Warriors going against the one-seeded Houston Rockets. Uh, this one should be fireworks. Everything Houston did in the off season was to, for this moment right here. So, what do you guys think that? What, what, what do you see from the moment? What's going to happen in this moment? Think it's going to work out for these dudes? They're going to get what they asked for. <laughs> they got to see us. They, they, they will build this team, but now let's see if you can really let's see if they keep that same energy. Now that they got a um, you know. Do you guys ever gotta, notice this? Jim? They got to actually play them now. When people go down from the Warriors, they always come back at like the perfect time. Do y'all ever notice that? Like Durant came back just in time to do his thing for the playoffs last Yo, season. Yo, the timing, the timing is impeccable. For like a round and a half, so then he came back, and they he's ready to go against Houston right now. Like their timing is perfect. Yo, what you say B? I, I really, I really, I really love James Harden's offensive game and everything about his game. I, I should like this dude, man. But in the biggest moments, he has been one of the largest choke artists that I've seen in the last decade, maybe longer. Like him and Chris Paul have done nothing to give me confidence that they can beat a juggernaut like Golden State. 
I have no I have no faith. Like they really have to show me. It's almost like uh, how we do the Atlanta Falcons in football. We just, I just can't believe in it. It's yeah, fun to watch. Show me. They had they got Antony as a coach. I can't believe, man. No, I can't. I can't do it. So that's that's my initial reactions. All right, so I mean, give me some analysis though. Like, what what needs yeah, to that's, happen? That's, that's actually that's actually a good point to be off to me because I think it's the same hesitation. Be like, we can we put at the Atlanta Falcons thing. Like, they fall into that same book. I think it's not just them two, but it's also Antony. Um, that gives you hesitation. Also, they're going to get the team that won two out of the last three NBA finals, um, and a team that really hasn't even like, I mean. They haven't even played their best ball this year yet. And and they haven't tried to either. <laughs> exactly. Like, they coasted through the regular season. Like, they was like, we already did the, the, the record pace thing. It worked out, and then we ended up losing the championship. Like, nobody's trying to expend that kind of energy anymore. Because, look, real, the, you know, the reality is, like, even after they did that, they got Kevin Durant. If they really wanted to try it again, they probably could have beat the seventy three and nine record on their way to a championship last year, but I think losing yeah, got in the finals that year gave them perspective of once you get this good, there's only one thing that's really important. So you know, guys, yes, sir. and all that kind of stuff because they're like, look, we right, so, we spent all our energy before and then we flamed out at the end. <laughs> so so, so we're gonna on? we're gonna analyze we're gonna analyze this. So. Chris Paul and James Harden are two of the best pick and roll players in the world, right? So that's their game, the pick and roll and the ISO. Golden State nullifies the pick and roll because they're built to defend via the switch. They can switch right. almost one through they can switch one through four. The only switch they can't make is probably at the five. Because Draymond is good on a guard you know, on a switch. Not saying he can take a guard head up, but he can slide his feet. Right. I right. think this favors I think this favors Golden State because they can give them so many looks defensively. They can switch, they can trap, they can bring Andre Iguodala off the bench. They've probably been feeding him all types of ginseng, ice in his <laughs> joints. I think we're gonna say I I think we're gonna see we're gonna see playoff Andre Eagle Dollar. Show up big. Oh, the eagle coming and back. He's gonna play. Yeah, the eagle coming back. So, I, I just think this favors Golden State as great a season Yo, as Houston has had. Golden State, Golden I, I, State is so deep that I forgot that because so you know, he had that big of an so I forgot about East Dollar. Then you still got Mr. West. You got like, I mean, Swaggy. Guys, it's man. How do you beat them? Yo, is that Swag. Swaggy P. Oh man. Yo, swag think, under um, control. I think um, um, JaVale McGee is going to play a role in this series as well because you're going to need him in spot duty with, with bum Clint versus Capella bum. down there. Not that Clint Capella is like yeah, a back-to-the-basket bas- post-up type dude. I've been hearing his name a lot too, and I hear about teams maybe offering Clint Capella to max. I'm like, yo, y'all fall for stuff so fast. Clint Capella is just like – the perfect type of center to play with a Chris Paul or to play with a um, a James Harden, especially James Harden. Chris Paul. Because we know Chris Paul has already yo, had yo, these, yo. like thin center, thin athletic centers who can't yo. post up, can't really shoot. Yo. That you know, <laughs> yeah. shoots a little better than Jordan. Yeah. But yo. he's going to throw alley oops all day and Clint Capella going to do the dirty work. Go get my but lunch. Man. Go get my lunch off the rim, boy. Yo, go get my back <laughs> scratches. Yo, go get a couple of rebounds, yo. Yo, stay out the so, way, man. Get out the lane. I'm about to work. So since Clint Capella does have that type of role on there, I think JaVel McGee might get more minutes than he would usually get. Um, but, no, it, it should definitely be interesting because the point that you made, B, was a great point because of the way Golden State is able to play defense not saying, okay, it's just going to make it easy for them to guard Houston or they can just guard those dudes. But I think that's going to, they, they're going to have a better shot at slowing Houston down than Houston has at slowing them down on the other end. So, yeah, we'll see. 
Uh, what's going to happen? What's, what's your prediction? Who wins it and then how many games? Go oh, ahead. You shoot first, Jimmy. I can go. I, I, I got. I say. I guess not. I say Warriors. I was, I'm, I'm six. Six. on mute. I say Warriors. Right, yeah, six. that's that's wild. Warriors. Warriors, say Warriors say in six. six. Game Damn. six is going to be Warriors. almost like that. They almost forced it to seven, but it's going to be Warriors in six. Yeah, I'm going the same way. I'm going Warriors and shit. Um, it's just that the Warriors are just a stacked team right now, man. It's their time. Um, both sides of the ball. It's, it's like I said, they haven't played their best ball yet. Um, they're leading up to this moment. Yo. Um, so I definitely got the Warriors in six, man. I'm like just about the guy they can bring off the bench. You start on the pitch. That's crazy. It's crazy. Now, bad. one I was... thing about the Rockets, the Rockets, the Rockets are like one of those uh, boxers that um got a knockout punch because when they three pointers start to fall. But the thing is, they got that too. Right. I mean, everybody else only has it because they have it. <laughs> everybody has to get shooters because they got to match up with these dudes. And my bad about the yapping Yo. in the background. Um, my young boy was trying to get his pick, so he wanted his pick um on air. Who we got and live. He said he got the Warriors in five. <laughs> Dak, Dak, he said, he said I don't give he the might. Rockets no respect. <laughs> he said he the Warriors in five. Let me ask you let me ask y'all a question. Let me ask y'all a question. And and I know that this is a dumb question that on face value. Yo, what are the Rockets gonna do about Kevin Durant? Um Shen, Trevor Malcolm Trevor Reason. I mean, a reason is going, to, is going to be his assignment. Who's not a bad defender, but Kevin Durant, it really doesn't matter. Yo, yo. Once Draymond texts him yo, in the Peter. middle of the night, tell him we need you, <laughs> it's over for him. So, yo, P.J. Tucker built – yo, P.J. Tucker built like he's a host on this show, so he don't matter defensively. Yo, I swear I'm not saying he has it because he's taking him for some reason. And, that, and this tells you that, you know, when the Rockets are on, I don't just sit and stare at their game all the way through. I've never in my life seen P.J. Tucker make a three-pointer, but I've seen him shoot like 100 of them. <laughs> like, nah, he make, he makes them every like, now and again. When I go to the bathroom, is he splashing threes? Because why do they let him keep shooting three-pointers? What's his percentage? <laughs> he must just make them when I'm out of the room getting a grub or something. All right, so – that's everybody's picks on that one. Let's go over to the Eastern Conference. We got Boston, and you got a lot of Boston fans out there. They're still crying for respect. Um, people thought the Bucks would give them a run. They beat the Bucks in seven. People thought the Sixers would beat them. They beat the Sixers in five. You know, they're, they're looking for the, for the underdog tag again. They, they're thinking, you know, people still going to pick against us. Um, I don't really have, you know, there's, there's really much, not much of a choice right now. Like, I don't want to disrespect them because <laughs> I have a lot of respect for what they're doing. But they're running up against LeBron at a at a desperate time right now. He's been a different person later in his career when faced with desperation until, of course, he gets to the NBA Finals, and it doesn't even matter. But um, real quick before we even get – into our picks for this series. This is a question that we've been asked a lot today, and I told people I would ask you guys on the air. The fact that Kyrie left Cleveland and Cleveland and Boston mm-hmm. are both still in the Eastern Conference Finals, essentially without him, does it make his decision to leave look even worse now? No, I saw that question being asked on social media, and it's the same question as saying, you guys won the Super Bowl with Nick Foles. You don't need Carson Wentz. Damn, that's a good No, that's no, a good Richard Rod. No, Richard Rod. Kyrie Irving is the third or fourth best point guard in the world, and Boston just happens to have a good coach and a very solid young team. And P.J. Tucker yes. shoots 35.6 from three and he's shooting 45% from three in the playoffs this year. Wow. It must be when I – I must get up a lot. <laughs> I must get up a lot. <laughs> um, so, basically, B, what you're saying is 
okay, Boston's good and they deep enough to make this particular run, especially in the East, without Kyrie. But they're still better with Kyrie. And, Absolutely. And that's, and if that's, what, that's, Absolutely. that's kind of what, that's only, where I'm thinking, too. I'm like, well, for all the people trying to – and the only people asking this question, you know who's asking this question. LeBron, LeBron fanboys LeBron are asking fans. this question because yeah. they're salty that somebody had the gall to publicly not want to play with LeBron. I, I, I get that because well, I get you here, guys' mind state. Mm-hmm. My perspective is um, him being out allowed those guys to kind of come into their own. So without him going out, we wouldn't even know that he do that. So, but now it's a matter of trying to make all those pieces fit at the same time. You know what I mean? Right. Which we said earlier, great problem, problem to have. Great problem. Exactly. It's a, it's a great problem to have. So it was actually a bonus to get these guys to, to get this experience and all the total to see how they can compete right. without him. Um, now you have a great problem. You have two guys who are all-stars coming back to a team that's in the Eastern Conference Finals at minimum. So, so we're, you know. It, we're all pretty much on the same page with that then, Jim. Because I'm like, like, y'all asking this question, like, if I'm Kyrie, I'm sitting back like, hell yeah, I made the right decision. If they can make this far without me, when I come back next year, we got a chance to do what I came here to do. So, yeah. I, Yo. I actually, actually going to get I that actually question saw, as a negative from one type of person's perspective. We all know I, what perspective that is. I actually, I actually saw one of the people that occupies LeBron James' underwear drawer actually try and justify this by saying, Kyrie made a terrible decision. Why wouldn't he want to stay with, uh, with the king? He has an opportunity to learn how to be great and learn – uh, how to win, and and I said, dude, learn how to watch draws like when me. he plays with LeBron. When he play, when he plays with LeBron James, you do realize that he cannot play the point guard position, not conventionally. Like he can't be a point guard. He he is only essentially a two guard playing with LeBron James. Also, why would I want to be the second fiddle to LeBron when we lose? I'm going to get all of the blame. And when we win, even if I hit the game-winning shots, LeBron is going to get all of the credit. And last, thirdly, who wakes up in the morning as a little kid and dreams, damn, I want to be Robin. I don't want to be Batman. I want to be Tonto. I don't want to be the Lone Ranger. I used to be out in the back, back of and, and, and I used to dream, I used to imagine that I was passing the ball with two seconds left to the best player in the team. Who was it be? <laughs> Beat Yo. everybody with this sucker mentality these days, man. Shout out to Kyrie, man. You made a good decision for yourself, and I personally think it's paying off. Hey, injuries happen. If he could stay healthy, and that team can stay as deep as it is, then like a lot of people think, you know, you might be talking about the Celtics and Sixers. You might not be talking about the Cavs. Not you know too much farther going along or. or Wherever LeBron ends up, if it's not on one of those two teams, <laughs> what if LeBron goes to the Celtics? LeBron comes to the yeah, LeBron. What if LeBron goes? Same thing. What if LeBron goes to the Celtics? Let me just for y'all. But Danny Ainge won't right. say no. You want me to take us out, Jim? <laughs> I, I can do. I know you. Yeah, yeah. Please, games, please do. Please do. Good, All right. Please well, give me y'all please pick do. real quick, and then I'll do that. Cavs, Cavs, Celtics. Cavs um, and five. I think this is. I think it's the Cavs and six. Um. Yeah, six games. Cavs and five. Um, I got five. the Cavs in five as well. I don't even like I said. I want to give Boston so much respect, but this type of story most times like comes to an end at this point. Like you've done all you can do with your backups and the depth that you have. Um, at some point you're gonna run into that juggernaut where all right, you need these dudes so y'all can go head up. But I'm not saying it's going to be, you know, it'll be like a Sixers series. It's going to be five tough, you know, hard-fought games. Say, who you got? Cavs or Celtics? Cavs or Celtics? Oh, how many games? Who is Terry Rozier, by the way? How many games? Uh, All right. The young boy says Celtics in five. So, y'all heard it here first. I think five yeah. is his favorite number. Yeah. 
He I'm tripping. Five is his favorite. He tripping. Um, all right, so it's time for us to get out of here. So thanks, brothers and sisters, for joining us for another briefing in the War Room. Shout out to everyone in the chat room, Facebook, Twitter, War Room Sports, Game Time on the Group Me app, and all the callers who called in to holler at us, and even the callers that we didn't end up getting to. We apologize. Tune in next week live right here or on demand as we catch you up on everything happening all around the world of sports, including continuing coverage of the NBA playoffs. So until then, enjoy your weekend, enjoy your week, and we'll see you right back here next time. Be sure to catch our conversations on Facebook and Twitter, as well as our blogs, webcasts, network podcasts on warroomsports.com. Also, make sure you pick up Jimmy's book at sportsthebook.com or warroomsports.com. Until next time, everybody, don't accept mediocrity. Be steadfast in the world against ignorance. He comes on top. Yo, he likes two, he likes two NBA players. Oh, he's an eight. www.warroomsports.com What? Ain't no more to it.